welcome once again to the Titus and Sergio Variety Hour podcast. And once again, we've taken the show on the road in our Rolling Stones mobile studio and we find ourselves in the offices of the Australian Financial Review. And who'd have thought that we'd ever find ourselves in here? I'm Stu- uh, Sergio Paradise and joining me as always is the next member of the Young Rich List. It's Titus O'Reilly. <laughs> well, I have turned up in my tux yeah. once I learned it was at the uh, AFR. And uh, I just wanted to, before we kick off and introduce our guest, yes. uh, I want to say thank you to Will Anderson, who we had on uh, Tuesday. Yeah, Will we had was fantastic. Great reaction to that. Um, and I want to thank all our supporters who have joined up, uh, who make us be able to do this uh, podcast. And I just wanted to say on um, the tickets for my gig on Friday 21st of April, which is coming up, in about a week, just over a week, uh, selling really fast in Sydney. Uh, it's at the Comedy Store, so I'd love to see people there. So if you do want to come, uh, jump on and get a ticket relatively quickly because I think we sold out last time we were there. So um, I'm looking forward to that. It should be uh, fun. Come on down. But today we've got uh, mm. AFR journalist extraordinaire, uh, is, can we call you that? <laughs> John Stenzolt, who writes about business and sport. Now, John, I always read your stuff on sport because... You go to the most important bit in sport, and that's the money. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. You must be scraping the barrel to have someone like me on. But <laughs> actually, I do. Uh, someone picked up on this once when I uh, was doing my best work at a sporting venue, and I think it was the, it was the XCO of uh, Tennis Australia, Steve Wood, who who spied me in the corporate box area and said, "Ah, this is where you get your stories. It's the corporate box for you, not the press box, isn't it?" And it's uh, sad but true. But the catering's better, at least <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> do they do you get full strength beer? Yeah, well, you do, and you get it in those glasses as well. And not, not eight bucks each. No, yeah. no, it's all free. So yeah, no, best of both worlds or something Wh- like which that. Which I think the AOC. <laughs> probably learned that's not always the best idea with uh, John Coates recently <laughs> taking on John Wiley in the uh, was it the Nitro Athletics they got into a bit of a verbal stat spout yeah that's right it was it was in the VIP area which uh, <laughs> you know it's probably more entertaining than what you usually do see in, in the VIP area so that would have been um that would have been fast, fantastic to see unfortunately I wasn't there for that one no there was a fair few people that watched it I'm surprised no one took pictures on their phone well this is the thing so I mean you know you talk about all the action being off on the field well this is what this is this is the real yeah. stuff that's happening off it, I think it's fantastic. I know Jesse Hogan gets caught having one cigarette and about 10 people take a photo of him and then <laughs> you've got two of the most powerful men in Australian sport having a Barney and no one thinks to take a picture. Well, I suppose that just shows I... how powerful those boys can be. I mean, <laughs> you would right. not be game to take a photo of John Coates. It's weird like that. Now, John, what's your background in sport? Like you were from Canberra? Originally, yeah. so NRLs your background or yeah. AFL? Well, I actually spent three years as a kid living in Italy as well. So soccer is my my great passion. Right. And growing up in Canberra, I also grew up in uh, the Canberra Raiders glory days of Mal Meninga, Ricky Stewart, Bradley Clyde, right. John Chicka Ferguson on the wing. I mean, that's probably they're probably my number one team. And the A League's a big passion of mine. I even wrote a book about it. Um, you know, big Aussie rules fan too. I don't know. Look, sport has has always been an obsession for me, and I still play soccer. So, you know, and here we are, writing, uh, trying to sort of connect it to my to my day job in the business world. So, is writing about the business of sport just a master plan of yours to get paid to go to sporting events and be able to say, "I'm what, when you're watching sport, I'm working, <laughs> I'm working right now," because that's always been my theory. If I can claim that me spending, you know, my entire weekend watching sport is work. It's not seen as just laziness. I think you're quite perceptive, actually, <laughs> Titus. Particularly, and then if you link it back to that corporate box part as well, it's, you know, see it, so I get a, I get a feed as well, and, a, and as you say, a couple of what years. What more could you want? Now, the connection between the rich and powerful, and you pull together the uh, rich list, don't you? For, yeah. Is it that, is that the AFR or the BRW one? Yeah, it we comes call it the BRW one. I think we're going to call it the AFR one this year. Is a bit of a branding thing, but yeah, you're right. The one that's been going for sort of thirty odd years. So I've you been doing pull together that uh, mm. that list. So. Mm. How, of the people on that list, how many have a strong link to sport as well, do you reckon? What sort of percentage? Is it a lot? Oh, it's it's, it's probably more of a case of on who on that list doesn't have a link to it. You could probably, I mean, you pick off sponsors, you pick off, you know, Gina Reinhardt backing all these Olympic sports or yeah. Andrew Forrest Fortescue being a sponsor or people owning teams like Jerry Ryan at the Melbourne Storm. Um, I, was all, I, I remember a conversation I once had with Greg Swan when he was the CEO at Carlton. Yeah. Uh, he said to me, "Oh, we've got the most um, we've got the most supporters on the rich list. 
we've got the most people on the rich list who support, you know, Carlton. Yeah. And I sort of thought, oh, that's a really interesting fact. But then I thought, well, I'm not really sure that's really helped them that much, has it? <laughs> <laughs> They've got lots of money. That's been their problem. They had a lot of money for a long time. And the minute you can't hand it to someone in a brown paper bag, they've come into a bit of trouble. <laughs> that's right. Damn those salary caps, right? <laughs> Terrible stuff. Um, now, just to give an idea to people, so you're writing out sport all the time. You sort of get a sense of how, how big is the sports industry in Australia? Like, you know, is it... Per capita, you always hear, especially with horse racing, we're, we're massively into sport. Is it? We can't compare to the states, obviously, and European soccer and stuff. But is it a lot of money oh, swashing it's, around? It's billions. It's probably you know tens of billions if you include the um you know the, the the amount that people gamble on sport, and if you include horse racing in that, yeah. you know that you know I mean, people. There was a stat that I wrote the other day that um. People betting on with the tab in pubs in New South Wales alone bet 1.6 billion a year. So that's just in the pubs, not even in the licensed clubs. In New, just New, just South, in New Wales. South Wales. So that's just that's just as a little thing alone. Then you talk about you know the AFL having oh, look half a billion revenue, NRL as well. Add in cricket, you've probably got the top four or five sports turning over between them a couple of billion dollars a year. So it's a huge it's a huge industry. And if you took that as an industry by itself, it's very comparable to the other ones that we write about in the Fin Review, which is why I thought you know. Know, the business of sport would be an interesting thing to do. Yeah, and so when you look at these all these sports, a lot of times I look at you know you look at the A League compared to the NRL compared to the AFL and all this, and you kind of wonder what's the why do some of them struggle or do the things they do or why do they do well? And is a lot of it come out of the fact that you know someone like the AFL, like a billion dollars a billion and a bit or, you know, almost a billion and a half TV revenue deals cover a multitude of sins? Well, it or does. is it they actually run, some of the sports are run better than others or is it a bit of combination, a bit of column A, a bit of column B? Oh, a little bit. But, I mean, I think probably what you'd find, I mean, I, I, did, a, I did an exercise a year ago, I probably should do it again soon, where I looked to, to try and find how many sports clubs are actually profitable in Australia across all the codes. There's only about a dozen of them, right? So... Most of the most of the clubs are actually running at a loss, and you're right. Like those those broad that broadcast money that comes in covers that sort of thing. So, right. and it's not that it's kind of this sort of thing between are we we're not running this as a pure business because our target is to win the Premiership Cup or you know the the Grand Final at the end of the year across all these sports. So then, you know, you make decisions with that in mind that inevitably mean spending more money, and someone covers that somewhere, be it broadcast rights or private owners or whatever. Well, John, you'd sort of touched on my next question which is is there a finite amount of dollars i mean there obviously is in australia and that pie has to be divvied up between these sports and as titus said are some better than the others at getting their piece of the pie oh the afl is very good at getting the money in right the broadcast rights that they've got but also the money that they've managed to extract from government over the last decade as well you think of all the stadiums around australia uh, that have been refurbished or rebuilt in that time. A lot of those are because of the the deals that AFL have been managed to strike with government. They're probably the best at it. Um, you know, well, Football Federation Australia got forty five million dollars out of the government to uh, we're on a World Cup bid, but maybe that's a, that's another <laughs> that, that that's another well. story altogether. Yeah. I mean, the sports are pretty good at it. Broadcast rights probably are concentrated in you know AFL, NRL, cricket in particular. They're all good at getting the money in, but they're also very very good at spending the money too. And uh, do you find with – so give an idea, the amount of money someone like, you know, how much bigger is the AFL compared to, say, you know, like going down a fair notch to, say, the NBL? Are you just comparing it almost a semi-amateur sport to a professional sport or is it a huge magnitude of difference there? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the AFL, which would turn over, you know, $550-odd million or something like that, against an NBL that uh, Larry Kesselman... It's quite an interesting story yeah. for, for business. You know, there's his one guy that essentially owns the league and he paid... We well, pumped $7, seven, seven million, million into it a couple of years ago. So... You know, he liked the game so much he bought the company. Well, yeah, it's a, <laughs> That's what it's he a little did, bit like that. Yeah. Or he owned a team and he thought, well, this league's going out the back door here. I'm going to do something about it. And he put his money where his mouth is, which actually very few people around the world take over an entire league, which is pretty crazy. What well, about... Oh, sorry. sorry, I was going to say, just on the Larry Kestelman hmm. of the NBL, do you reckon $7 million in the, the big picture is not a staggering amount of money? Do you reckon it's going to be a good investment for him down the track? Because it... The NBL seem, it seems to be doing pretty well the last couple of years. Whether, whether that's the bottom line, I'm not sure, but audiences and 
kids' participation and, and crowds at the games. Do you reckon it'll be a good good uh, investment for Larry? Where it could be a good investment is, and what he's doing is trying to get investors into the league from China, for example. Oh. So if someone comes in and buys a chunk of the league for, you know, 15, 20 million, he suddenly doubled his money. In the meantime, he's got to, he's got to actually pump money into the league to get there. So he's got to, spe- you know, speculate to accumulate in that way. So if he gets teams in from China or... You know, the Philippines is another market that's crazy about basketball in the region. He'd probably love to have teams from both. He's actually got business investments in, in the Philippines, by the way. So if he can get the money in from there, then all of a sudden, yeah, it becomes a wise investment. But otherwise, I mean, to, to class sport and investment, mm-hmm. look, you might get a situation where sports clubs get bought and sold for more than they, they have. But there's not many examples. It's mostly it's mostly the owners kind of covering the losses, well, really. It's like horse racing. For every Winks or Black Caviar... You know, there's a lot of people who haven't made a cent out of owning a racehorse. Oh, absolutely. So, and know, some of the I richest people in the sport. Surely saying. that's not true. <laughs> oh, well, we've often said, Titus and I, that if there's one sport that you get guaranteed to make a dollar on, it's horse racing. <laughs> <laughs> there's huge amounts of money in horse racing. Uh, give us an idea then of comparing more apples and apples. Um, there's been a lot le- recently about whenever the, a- uh, the AFL sign a TV rights deal, the NRL come out and sign one relatively, you know, it's often a similar time. Yes. And they both try and make out that they have got the biggest deal either on a per capita basis or... And you often read that the NRL have bigger ratings uh, on certain Mm. events. uh, But what are the relativities between those two in terms of actually the dollars? Like what's the real story? Because a lot of the NRL clubs are a bit annoyed with the commission at the moment perceiving that the money that they thought was going to be there isn't quite there. Yeah, well, I mean, the broadcast rights on both is actually they're actually pretty comparable. Right. And the thing is, is that the NRL want to make some really big investments in their actual core business. Right. And things like you know coming up with this big me- digital media strategy that might cost them twenty million bucks a year. Things like that, which means that not as much money flows to the clubs. Right. But on a broadcast basis, yeah, the numbers are pretty close now because, as you say, like State of Origin is genuinely probably the you know the most amazing TV product in this country. Um, in so terms of ratings terms and of ability ratings. to sell sponsorship Absolutely. and everything. Absolutely, yeah. And um, the rugby league on Fox Sports, for example, uh, rates extremely well, very, very well. It's a fantastic product for Fox. Where the NRL really struggles when it comes to the money stakes is still in that sponsorship. Uh, so the AFL right. is very, very good at getting sponsorship money. There's a big gap between what you know what between those codes. Some of that it really is to do with the perception that rugby league is not a good sport to invest in from brands. You think of all that player misbehaviour and that sort of thing. And then obviously crowds as well. I mean, rugby league crowds have stagnated for a decade. They blame that on the poor stadiums in Sydney and that sort of thing. But league, you know, you're, you're looking roughly an average of fifteen or sixteen thousand fans a game, no matter what. And maybe that's because they're all sitting at home watching on the telly, but. You know, obviously AFL gets much bigger crowds, so you're getting more money from that. So they got, so it's a more diverse revenue streams for yes. AFL compared to NRL. And so would that make the AFL definitely the richest code currently going around? And buy a lot or buy a bit? Uh, yeah, look, it is. I mean, there's, I think there's probably, what are we talking, maybe, I mean, if you want to take all the clubs together, then it, it's, it's still a big gap, but you might be talking, you know, uh, between 50 and 100 million when it comes to governing bodies itself. Cricket's rising up very rapidly. And yeah. if you think of it, probably on a player per head basis, cricket's probably the highest paid sport. Now, I remember that they had that debate about, you know, AFL was coming to take out all the young cricketers years ago. Mm. Um, you know, there was more money in AFL. Well, I mean, you have you have Sheffield Shield cricketers that are supposedly averaging three, four hundred odd thousand dollars a year and getting money to pay twenty twenty overseas too. Mm. Everyone on the Australian cricket team is getting a million dollars a year plus, pretty much. I mean, that's yeah, probably where the money is. Young cricketers, I know just from talking to them, who you've never heard of and who, who aren't even sort of uh, looking to make the Australian team. I know that's probably beyond them, but given what they can earn in India. And lower class cricket here, they're, they're all, a lot of them are making eight, nine hundred thousand, a million bucks a year, as you say, just from international cricket. And, and these are guys who aren't your elite, your top eleven cricketers in the country. So I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Per capita for for a player, cricket, I reckon is you know, and this is purely down to I guess the 2020 brand. The last ten years or so has just gone nuts. Oh, it has, yeah. And look, you know. It, it helps at India too every couple of years too, right? And we sell the rights to India, also sell them over to the UK. And let's face it, it helps. There's only, what, 11 cricketers on the field you know, compared to you know, 18 plus, the, you know, the interchange for AFL. I mean, they've got, AFL's got to have these huge lists, whereas 
you know, what's the cricket squad, 16, 17, maybe per state, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's where probably um, the, you know, the AFL suffers in comparison on the pay scale, which is why there's been this big, you know, CBA negotiations and, mm. and, and, and the big fight that they're trying to have to yeah. get more money. And what about the A-League then? Where is that sort of sitting amongst all the um, – it, it's below cricket – but, you know, above – is it above the NBL? Is it above oh. netball? It gets, it, it's comfortably above those? Yeah, well and truly. I think, I think uh, if you, you know, if, you, if you, you could probably go roughly, you know, AFL, NRL, cricket, and then you're looking at something like the FFA, which turn over roughly $100-odd million a year. Yeah. You know, Australian Rugby Union's around that mark too. They've just got a big chunk of, you know – of broadcast revenue that's come in, but then they're still having financial issues. There's a big then there's a big then there's really you know a big drop off to the other sports. To I mean, the other sports, right? Yeah. And, that, and where would you put horse racing in the middle of that? Because it's sort of a bit unique with its amazing amount of gambling around that. It's so a it's very sort parochial of, thing, racing, because it's sort of the, the the administration of it is split amongst all the states and and even yeah. in exactly. the states amongst various racing clubs. There's mm. no overarching sort of governing body like a, an AFL commission or an NRL commission. That's right. But uh, you're absolutely right. So, but Racing Victoria, for example, is probably, well, the last couple of years, it's been the most profitable sporting organisation in the country, making you know profits between 30 to 50 million because of all that extra revenue coming in right. due to the race fields fees that they charge. So, but I mean, yeah, all those but other codes. But it's all gambling, is it, it? Well, pretty much. Pretty much. Like I mean, you, you, know, you get out. some crowds that will go to Flemington for the, you know, four or five days of the year, but it's it's mostly gambling and, you know, other fees associated with, you know, registering horses and that sort of stuff, really. So what about where's – when you look at where people are getting money from, what where's the various – sort of revenue streams that are popular. So TV rights is at the top of the pyramid. Well in terms and truly. Of, right. So well if you're running a sporting comp and you don't have the TV revenue coming in, you're in you're in trouble basically. Yeah, that's, that's the key. Yeah, that's and right. And then is it sponsorship sort of next level or? It is. Uh, or t- or ticket too, sales as well. Yeah. And I, well, Sorry, we should have chucked Tennis Australia in there too yeah, because yeah. they have a huge amount of money that comes in uh, for the Australian Open, which is basically their, you know, one big event. So really you'd, you'd put tennis above soccer but it's 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 funny that's not a year round thing it's really just from one big one event, event and maybe a couple of you know maybe a couple of uh, you know, associated then, uh, things but really for them it was that they split sort of roughly you know 30 30 30ish but certainly the TV rights is pushing way up for them and other sports um, these days, is that the international component helps yeah, them out? Definitely, yeah. definitely. And you know, if you if you if you're uh, selling your rights in in US dollars, for example, it, you know it helps when you convert it back to Aussie dollars, things right. like that. So, um, something like tennis. I mean, the, the ticket sales are huge because they're selling you know seven eight hundred thousand seat tickets to the Australian Open. So it's just one big bang. So they're other almost like a farmer harvesting out. once a year. Yes, yes. It all works around yeah. that one event basically and then they, they make everything and that sets them yeah, up for the year. They're, they're a, a farmer harvesting once a year but they're selling their product not just to the local market, just yep. to the international yeah, market. Got it, they can sell whereas, it everywhere. Yeah, whereas the AFL might go for six months of the year. But it's, a, it's very all, much a yeah. local market, and that's the unique thing about tennis. Really, that you know the market for them is global, and then that they happen to just from a historical quirk own one of the four Grand Slams in the world, right? I mean, and so therefore they're you know one of the fourth, they're basically the fourth richest tennis federation. So they spend a lot of money as well, and they all spend a lot of money on this chase for the grassroots developments and when this you, sort of John, thing. John, when you just mentioned the four tennis Grand Slams, remind mm. me of the four golf majors. Mm. Where does golf sit in Australia compared to the other sports? Oh, it's pretty low really yeah. because now, I mean, the, the golf tour, you know, no essentially three to four tournaments at the very, very most. And even those are, are, are essentially, and it's a bit like the V8 supercars too, that's also in there, but you need um, government money to really, you know, hold those events. Without government money, they don't really, you know, they can't they can't fly sure. these days. There's not much television money in golf here in Australia. There is a fair bit of television money in the V8s actually. They signed yeah. a six-year, 260, I think it was 240-ish million dollar deal with Fox and 10. So there is that. But every one of those events, pretty much, um, that they have, uh, you know, dotted around the country, only gets done because they get backed by the government, you know, in each state. Right. So one of the big things when you talk to the V8s is, yes, we've done a television deal, but we've also done a deal with the Queensland government to renew our deal in, you know, on the Gold Coast or Townsville or whatever as well. So there's a lot of that government support that they, those sports need. So they're basically their events are subsidised by the government Correct. To, for tourism slash jobs 
uh, economic activity like in the local areas. Yeah, it's Melbourne. the old major event strategy, yeah, get a big, you know, event in and hopefully that generates jobs and tourist nights and, you know, hotel accommodation and so on and so forth, yes. Right. And what's the uh, – how big then is gambling across all these sports? Like how wedded – uh, as a revenue stream, is it is it the fastest growing revenue stream out for all of them, or what's the sort of relativities and how big is it compared to say TV rights and and other forms of sponsorship? Well, so with the gambling, in effect, I mean, you know, the, a lot of people t- clip the ticket along the way, right? So if you go to the tab and or you know if you get on your your app and uh, make a bet, well, there's a big chunk of that will have to go to the government through taxes. Right. A big chunk will go to the the company itself right. to make the profits. And then what the and then the sports and racing obviously charge what they call you know race fields fees or you know for their for so a fee that they charge for these people to essentially able to you know have a market on whatever race or whatever contest so it does feed down to the sports it is a growing part of it but you know we're talking maybe tens of millions against you know hundreds of millions when it comes to broadcast so yeah look there's a lot of money in the gambling and that essentially is the horse racing industry. That is the gambling industry. That's a bit different to what happens with sport. But without gambling, horse racing probably wouldn't exist. Well, Well, they did that in South Australia back in the sort of 18th, in the 19th century. They banned betting and the industry basically died overnight and they had to reverse it all because everyone was out of a job, you know, just didn't. They've sort of done that test already. So what about though with the NRL and the Mm. AFL, they might not get the huge cut of the actual gambling activity, mm. but do they get a lot through the ads that can be sold on TV coming back in the form of TV rights? Yeah, well, yes, there is that, absolutely. They, they a, they also so if to, gambling all yeah. stopped, like if you ban gambling tomorrow, mm. what impact would that actually have on these TV right deals? So, I mean, I know you can't probably give exact stats, but would it have a size, would it have a noticeable impact? Oh, you'd probably see the three commercial networks go out of business just about if they didn't have, if they didn't have it's um, that big. betting. It's that big. I mean... Um, so that, that is, it is generally that big because mm. we, we all think that we and, and everyone thinks you just all we see on TV is bloody gambling ads, but it is actually a fact. If you look at the the, the categories that um, do the biggest amounts of advertising on television, it's you know inevitably it's things like you know retail, so you know your supermarkets, yep. uh, your Coles, your, your, and your Harvey Normans and those sort of yep. ones, yep. your foods, and then it's gambling, and it's, it's right. literally top three or four now above the, alcohol. Yeah, well, there's more restrictions, I think. Are you right. fond of alcohol, particularly on, on <laughs> so certain types of day, would you believe? But, that, yeah, because there's a, there's, a, there's a nuance there where they yeah. can still advertise during live sport even if it's in the I know, I do so. find it odd that I can bet on Peppa Pig, but they won't advertise beer on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> so uh, tell me about we've um, just – so basically that's like giving us a good overview of sort of the sports environment. Um can the Australian economy, as it's going on the general trends, can it support this these many sports at the level it is? Like we often hear that it's a zero-sum game, like the AFL are going to take over or the NRL are now doing better or A-League are going to die or whatever. Is it a zero-sum game like that? Is it, you know, is any of the clubs actually getting, like is the AFL getting stronger and stronger like the narrative often runs or and are going to beat NRL into the ground eventually if you go forward 100 years or is that just not true? There is enough room for all these different sports. There, there, there probably is enough room given how sports mad this country is but, I mean, there's only so much. I think we're getting to the, I think we're getting to the edge of it. I mean, I think what you found with Super Rugby, for example, it's run into financial difficulties and it's going to cut a team either in... Melbourne or, or Perth, Perth they've yeah. probably reached their horizon there. So can we support 18 AFL teams? Well, obviously the AFL's got a lot of money and they're going to, but GWS and the, the Suns sun. are going to need money for decades and decades and decades. So, you know, as long as, the, as, long as that central body's going all right, yes, but I think the caveats are that... A sport like rugby might start getting crowded out because you know it, it, it sort of expanded beyond its natural you know New South Wales and Queensland a little bit of the ACT yeah. and, and has come unstuck a little bit um, and the national sports like you know cricket I think is always going to have that have that uh, you know fantastic summer uh, flavor I think soccer if it ever gets its act into gear should survive but We've been saying that about the code, which is very dear to my heart for decades as well. So, really, um, those the, the AFLs and the NRLs have got to 
big and cricket got a big big advantage. I think that uh, it sort of entrenched them. I think in a way. Yeah. Do you just I was talking about AFL getting a few of the issues around the AFL? The, how how badly financially are the Suns and and the Giants actually going? Because they're being pretty much subsidised. I've heard from tens of millions of dollars, and you can see some of this in the annual report, but some of it's a bit not clear to read when you read the annual report. But, you know, they're being subsidised a lot by the AFL, aren't they? They they are they would fall over tomorrow without the AFL support. Oh, so would a lot of other clubs, though. But they but, are completely pretty much that way. That's how they are going that badly, in a way. Well, I mean, well, I mean they, they'd argue that, you know, that's not necessarily badly at all because, you know, we're, they're still in a start-up phase. And so every time I say anything negative about the GWS, then... You know, the president, Tony Shepard, uh, gives me a call, so hopefully <laughs> Shep's uh, listening. He likes uh, giving a call. He, you know, he, he certainly does, but he loves the fin like review. Yeah. No, no, look, they, they both get at least $10 million more than any other club does on an annual basis. Right. They've obviously both um, benefited from the AFL negotiating, you know, stadiums to be constructed for them or for stadium deals to happen. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely, they're on the trip to the AFL, but that's, that's all part of the long-term term strategy. Now... You can argue, and I think until the cows come home, whether that's actually right or wrong, but that's what they're doing. And, yeah, they're going to need that extra money for a long, long, long time. So the AFL's challenge is if TV rights take a, a downward trend or, you know, right right now we had the global financial crisis, but things are okay. They're mm-hmm. not, you know, we're not in a terrible time. If, if we had a prolonged period of economic downturn, they would be real drag anchors around... The AFL, or they, they're so rich it doesn't really matter. I think I think for at least for a decade they're probably so rich it doesn't matter. And then you know if you talk if you if you say that the broadcast rights tap's going to be turned off, well, you know sports the only live thing that people want to watch these days just about and advertisers want that. I mean, uh, you know, are our networks, are the TV networks in trouble? Yeah, probably. But, I mean, maybe there's, you know, the days of it getting closer that we all watch and consume everything through, you know, your Googles or your Facebooks or your yeah, Twitters AFL or whatever. Yeah, website or app or exactly. whatever. You don't so even, there's, there's so th- they actually cut out the middleman at some point. Yeah. And well, I mean, if, I think the rights are okay as long as they, there's competition for those rights. If yeah. there's just one bidder, then obviously they're, they're going to be stagnant in that regard. But... But the, the, the NRL and um, – just getting on as something else slightly, but the, the NRL and the AFL realistically, if it got to the point where, you know, we, we are consuming everything over the internet, is there a legitimate strategy for them in 10 to 15 years of going, why have a TV network? We'll just you, – you, you pay to subscribe to our app and we sell to advertisers and we just run it all ourselves. Is that where they're trying to eventually go? Oh, they're, they're set up in case it goes that way, but it's, right. a, but it's hard to it's, – it's still hard to make money you know, just from a direct broadcast. You'd have to charge people – you know, a some sort of a model. subscription. Yeah. You'd have to then charge the advertisers a premium as well. At the moment, um, football or any sport really just by itself is, isn't necessarily profitable for those networks. They use that, you know, to get the eyeballs in and to promote, you know, the heck out of the rest of their network, the rest of their like shows. Rule like during the tennis. They, absolutely, the tennis yeah. is the classic example for that. I mean, the tennis is seven. That, that business it is, model it works for is amazing. That's yeah. what got them back to number one. Uh, and the BBL is the same for ten. They just, you know, every five seconds you were getting I'm a celebrity ads basically. That's right. It's the old <laughs> the old halo effect. Use the sport to promote everything else, which is hopefully cheaper to buy, yeah. uh, cheaper to produce in the sport. So you and then you make a some sort yeah, of a profit also, overall. Yeah, I, mm. I think the Australian public, it, it's, there's still quite a. Few, this is just my opinion, but quite a few years away from accept, accepting the fact that they can't watch um, their sport when they want it. On free to air, and, I and mean, and, and even the back well, the, saying, the you know, you experience to... with the Premier yes. League is an example of that. And the, and there's legislation with anti siphoning, sure. the anti siphoning list, which which protects those free to air networks yeah. from you know from you know being torn apart by pay TV, probably you know. So yeah. there is going to be that that free to air you know thing for quite a while. I, don't, I can't see a government giving that up because it's, just, no. it's, a, it's a vote loser that, you know, you, you take our sport off our free-to-air TV. It's not many countries that probably say that, but that's Australia, isn't it, where sport's yeah. mad. <laughs> what about the current play, uh, the pay deal that mm. seems to be dragging on a bit longer than I think everyone expected? I think originally they sort of broke off talks, surprise, surprise, ahead of Christmas and came back sort of end of Jan 
saying, oh, it's time to talk now. And it's like, well, you really just had Christmas, January <laughs> off right. like everyone yeah. else. It wasn't like a big statement. Yeah. Or the AFL Commission were at Noosa. Um, mm, it yeah. seems that Paul Marsh, who had a lot of success at the cricketers, the Australian Cricketers Association and around a revenue sharing model and um, is trying to do that at the AFL, is trying to bring in this revenue sharing model. It seems the players, it seems that the AFL are dead set against that. And the players are a bit, seem a bit more keen to do it this time than in the past. I, I've always thought the AFL Players Association is more a stepping stone for people who want to go and later on work in yes. the, at the AFL. Yes, yes. Um, and you saw that with Demetrio, and mm-hmm. you saw it with Finnis, Finnis and yeah. you've seen it with. And so it used to be almost amazingly how much they would cave over and do the right thing by the AFL after putting up a bit. And the players didn't seem to care either. I'm getting a sense around the money and and that Marsh isn't of that same. He doesn't strike me as like he's done the Australian Cricket Association. He's now doing the AFLPA. He seems less I want to run the AFL one day. I could be reading him completely wrong, but more I'm a genuine union leader or... You know, well, they're an association, which means they're a rich union. Yeah, that's <laughs> like right. the AMA. Indeed. You don't call yourself a union if your members are rich. Um, do you get that sense too? And how much is that revenue sharing deal? Why the AFL so against that? I'm assuming it's because they're predicting revenue is only going to increase. You know, the, the, that if, if they thought revenue was going to die in the in the ass over the next. 10 years, they would probably agree to the revenue sharing. Yeah, that's is it right. as simple as that? Oh, look, it is. I mean, Marsh was, you know, basically hired to get that percentage. You know, that's his, that's his, he that, that's what he's famous for, right? Success, right? Absolutely. And it's interesting without him there at cricket, cricket are now trying to get out of that deal, you know, by trying to divide yeah, and conquer they're the cricket. Yeah, they're pushing their new, um, who's the old Melbourne player, um, yeah, Alistair, Alistair, Alistair Nicholson, Nicholson there, yeah, yeah. and they're testing him to go, Absolutely, we would yeah. like to not have this revenue sharing Yeah, that's right, agreement. try to divide the players off to and have the it. elites on something like that and the, and the lower tier on, you know, different different sort of contracts. Yeah, and so, use the women as a wedge over there. Right. Quite it's divide, and, like it's it's quite, divide and conquer, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah, oh, look, yeah, with the so AFL, the AFL, no AFL one, doubt. is it a big deal? The, what, what, explain to people mm. why the percentage model, which is, you get a percentage of how much money you're making. Why is that such a big thing for the players? Basically, is it that they will be better off overall under that? Well, it does lock them in. It does give them certainty. I suppose that they'll get you know x amount of revenue every year, and and therefore they can you know plan accordingly. I suppose, and and, and we'll get we'll reap the rewards when when as you say the AFL revenue keeps rising. The AFL, on the other hand, and this is this almost goes back to a classic sort of management and and you know em, em, employer employee relationship here. They don't want to be wedded to this because they want to go off and spend money, propping up the GWS, expanding into the Gold Coast, that sort of thing. You know, helping out the Lions when they need it. So they they say that they would need this flexibility, you know, for their business model to work because you know what happens if we need to spend money over here one year if there's a crisis, or what happens if we want to go and buy Eddie Had Stadium, th- things like that. So they don't want to be locked in to having to always Almost a floating slice amount. off this revenue yeah. every year. They want a fixed fee over the next five years, yes. like they do. They, we know we've got this much coming in from TV rights. We know we've got this much going out for wages, and then the rest is ours to do with. With and what if, we want. And, and, and the harder we work to boost that revenue mm-hmm. by putting our brand on coffee pods, as I saw they've done recently. <laughs> oh, or, goodness me. You know, they have. You can get you gi- can I saw it, you know, you can got, like, giants or Melbourne demons coffee pods. Just to, to, to the, uh, <laughs> did, did the Collingwood uh, pods leave a bitter aftertaste? Yeah, I think <laughs> so. They, they've just um, they've got a hint I'm a Collingwood of fan. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they have a hint of Woodstock bourbon oh, about them. <laughs> uh, that's kind of the thing. But... So that, and that's where I've heard the AFL argue before. Will we bring in revenue that the players don't work hard for, that we work hard for, um, and we don't want to be sharing that that sort of sharing money? Like, yeah, that's you know, right. We they don't want to be wedded to it. I mean, you're right. Absolutely. They, you know, they they want to have they want to have different strategies for it. And how serious do you think this could get? Do you think a strike is because uh, it's funny? Like you kind of in Australia, everyone thinks there isn't going to be a strike because there never is. But in the States, there used to never be any strikes. And then it's sort of like once someone breaks that, you know, the surface tension the first time, once that happens, it will be almost could become a cyclical thing that you have where in the States in each, in each sport, it almost seems like every 20 years now, 
they do about three or four EBAs, and then but the fourth one or something is where it all goes right. There's too much bad blood from the last three where we papered over the cracks. Now we've got to have a big blow up to restart. And you saw that with the NHL. Of NHL have done that recently. The, you know, um, is that what you think could happen here? Do you think we're because I mean it's just a matter of maturity of it being a business in a way that it gets to that point. I think the difference here between here in America is all of those uh, sports clubs in America are private franchises yeah, and they're huge own, yeah. businesses got their in their own, own, own right. and got their so own own. they own their own stadiums you know they own their own uh well, you know parking lots around it exactly all that sort of stuff is is all yeah. connected to their owners so the owners that is and for a lot of them that is their owners business whereas here you know the clubs are mostly non-for-profits they're mostly in the community they all are in the afl so Perhaps we have more of a sense we, as in you know fans or the general actually public, own it. yeah, have a sense of ownership. We're members of this club, so it's not as sort of you know nakedly you know capitalistic here as it is over in America. Having said that, I mean I don't think you could ever rule it out, but I don't. I'm not sure players really want to strike because they'd be extremely worried here about you know the public perception of them, the and I think they'd be worried about it more here than they do in America for some reason. I think the only thing that would make a big difference is if the money was really disproportionate, like the difference between uh, rolling over and pushing for the percentage model made a huge difference for each individual player. Um, you know, some of those other sports had to really treat their players badly for a very long time to get to the position where there was the anger to... For them to be right, we're going to strike, um, and you saw that historically with league splitting from union and various things. Where uh, and and Kerry Packer took advantage of this with World yeah. Series cricket. Yep. If you underpay and treat players terribly for a long time, it will blow up in your face eventually. It seems to me that AFL players aren't on that bad a wicket that it's kind of are we really going to go to war over this and lose a year out of my you know, most AFL players go I've got a ten year career, let's write one of them off to a strike. That's right. I mean, they're not on a bad wicket at the moment. So it's more about improving their wicket and getting getting what you know they consider to be the fair share of all the money going into the code. So they're not sort of yeah, I guess being oppressed if if you like. There's no maximum wage like they used to be in yeah. in the English soccer back in the day. You know, something like that where they would keep all the players at the one clubs. There's no. I mean, look, there's nuances around free agency and you know veterans lists and and that sort of thing as well. That and and I, and I think. Actually, it's quite interesting that about the players' careers being so short, the players, and I think the AFL agrees with them more and more in this these days, is about getting a chunk of this money for uh, players after their careers are finished. Yeah. So, you know, superannuation or annuities yeah. or whatever, things Long-term like that. Long-term injury Long-term payments, stuff. things yeah. like that. Yeah, I think, I think they're probably more in agreement with that. But I also think there's a PR battle here. I reckon if they can agree somehow that the players get more money and it comes out that the AFL aren't paying a fixed percentage of revenue, yeah. as long as they're okay, as long as that happens, and I think the AFL will be all right, they just don't want to be seen, I think, you know, maybe amongst their other captains of industry around to be actually paying 27% or 26% well, and be I, wedded to that because that doesn't work well in the corridors of power. i got a sense that basically this has got to come down to a point where either two scenarios. One, that they truly are wedded to a percentage model, the Players Association and the players support them to the hilt and they're not going to budge unless they actually get that. All the AFL are going to have – and that that means you could end up in a strike. Or there is a price that the Players Association will accept to say, all right, we drop our rights to a percentage model but we're going to, you're going to pay us a chunk of change in some particular way and it might be in a – future payments for, yeah. you know, deal um, to, to get us to drop this. Almost, it's not an amber claim exactly, but it's the the thing to use to up the price as much as possible. Or you do the old compromise where you agree on a set percentage up to a certain amount and then it's like a some sort of, a, you know, floating amount above that. You might get 25 plus a share in something into the future, right. which kind of like ends up being a win-win situation. Which is for what all. Cricket Australia have done where yeah. they don't, you know, it's a revenue sharing but not all revenue is counted in that revenue sharing. So they've split out some things so that they can sort of make it so it's the the percentage they say is not the real percentage of total total revenue of cricket australia yeah that's right and they also come back towards the end of like the four-year cycles and stuff and figure out that they've actually got more revenue in and the players get a chunk of a big chunk as well so yeah there's yeah there is certain nuances to it so john tell us about aflw started there's a bit of argument about the, the actual how much the women were being paid and the afl had to come back and and up it a little bit but it's still both is is that ever going to be a money-making venture or is that always going to be subsidised a bit by the men's game 
from what you've seen of it? And I mean, we're going off one year's result. Yeah, it's hard to say because I mean, they didn't charge at the gate in the AFLW, right? So it was yeah. free. So it was a great time of year. People had that sort of pent up demand yeah. for footy. People and were and people sudden, excited about the new exactly. thing and all that. So it's hard to say. I mean, look, there was you know good good um, ratings on TV, particularly early on. So that, you know that that sort of probably sets you know some sort of value on the TV rights. Yeah. Um, I think it was very clever to you know link every, all the link all the clubs to you know existing yeah, AFL clubs. You couldn't have the Darabin Falcons as as, yeah. as beloved as they are in my family. Um, <laughs> you know, going you know playing on a national scale. So it was it, you know look one probably has to go with the other. Uh, there is some sort of value there, I think, potentially. Like it could actually make money, you think, to an extent. It's you'd have, to, you'd, you'd have to judge it. You'd have to judge it by charging people attendance at, at the gate, and yeah. I think you'd still probably go okay there. And also uh, for a couple of years, and I mean, but at the moment it's like a you know it's six or seven weeks, and it almost you know, is a taster season. for the for the proper yeah. men's season. You know, so yeah. it's hard. It's very hard to judge its merits on its own. There is something there though, clearly. It did capture some sort of imagination. Yeah. How long long term it is is a good question. I mean, obviously the standards have to improve and all that sort of thing, and I'm sure they will over time. But there is something there that grabs people about it, and that's because it's football. Yeah. Yeah. I reckon there's other sports who, who've looked at the success of the AFLW and gone. The NRL have team. announced they're going to have a women's competition. Yeah. yeah. But yesterday, I think they put a bit more detail around it. Again, as long as it's linked to those clubs. You're, get a, already, you're tapping into an existing I think existing you're tapping base. into something, yeah. I mean, the A-League and W-League probably haven't done that enough. I mean, you know, the, the standard of the W-League is really, really good, but I don't think the A-League clubs have embraced it anywhere near. They probably, I mean, some of it just sort of see it as a bit of an annoyance because they're all private owners and they see it as a cost. You right. know, or they don't link properly with it or it's run by state federations where, you know, there is something, there is potential there. You get a feeling that the AFL clubs, women's side of the teams are really part of the actual club. They're not a, an add-on. They really seem to have done that integration pretty well. Well, they had to. Well, they, these clubs had to bid for the licences, right? Yeah. So they didn't so just they impose sort of, it they on sort every of club. Wanted it, yeah. Exactly. So they had to want it and show what they were going to do with it, which I think was very smart. Yeah. Now, getting to the NRL, um, they, they've had an interesting thing where. It took them a lot longer to get to an independent commission than the AFL. The AFL started looking at independent commissions actually back in the late 70s and, and even ran occasionally like an independent commission, even though legally they didn't have all the power at times, they still acted like one. Um, the NRL took a long time to get to an independent commission. They had to be sort of kick, dragged there kicking and screaming. And since that's come in, it seems that, for you know, a lot of our listeners would be sort of AFL fans predominantly, but would be across this a bit. The independent commission is currently being challenged very strongly by the clubs. In the AFL, it's kind of become accepted and seen as such a key part of the success of the code. In the NRL, the clubs themselves are really not, you know, it's um, they're really not happy. Like they've been touch and go of whether their chair would even still be around at this time of year. He had a huge challenge to him, particularly late last year and early in the year. And why is that? Why is why are they kicking back when the AFL clubs have kind of accepted it? Well, so it probably goes to the structure of the actual competition. Uh, you know, again, uh, as you've said, you know, a couple of the AFL clubs are effectively propped up by the AFL itself. They're all community, like non-for-profit clubs, whereas half the NRL are actually um, owned privately. So these guys look at it as a business and that business is all about getting what's best for that club rather than the competition as a whole. So I, I know that one should probably go together with the other, but they went in there to try and get as much money for clubs as possible and therefore as much money for their own club as possible. Right. And, you know, the NRL kind of had to push back against that eventually because they didn't actually have as much money as they thought they might So right. to pay the club. So it probably goes back to that private ownership structure in there and the fact that the NRL, some of these NRL clubs have got, you know, very powerful sort of behind the scenes uh, you know, people pulling the strings. So there is definitely, I reckon, a Sydney cowboy effect to the NRL in their ownership and the way those things play out, as opposed to the, you know, the NRL commission. Hello, Sydney. What we? Yeah, hello, <laughs> just, just add that to the list of places I've bagged. In the last and now people in Sydney will say, "What? We don't have an Eddie Maguire or, yeah, yeah. or, or a David Kosh amongst our ranks." But but it yeah, is a it's big a bit difference. Less, it's yeah. a bit less. It's a it's bit, a bit sort different of having an owner of a club, isn't it, than the sort of community-based ones you've got here? Oh, exactly. Because they'll go in and say, "Hey, we're spending money here. This is our money at stake." Yeah. 
this is our this is our business. So we want to say in what's actually going on. Exactly. So the right. clubs are now arguing that they want more seats on the independent commission, which which will dilute its independent. This. Yes, um, and it's also <laughs> happening in the in, in the A League and the, the FFA as well, which is one. precisely the same scenario. All those clubs are privately owned. You, you, we were talking before because one thing you see is the AFL announced their big broadcast deal, the NRL announced theirs, so there's plenty of money going into the NRL. Um, and they've also long, had a long history with pokey revenue as well, which the AFL had a lot less of in the past. And so the NRL, especially the New South Wales clubs, so the, the NRL obviously had money but the clubs are much more, we're not seeing enough of it. Are the clubs getting less, seeing less of the money than the AFL? Are the NRL clubs basically getting less money, you know, the, the independent commission keeping more of it in the NRL than the AFL? Well, it's a little bit like the AFL where they want to try and keep a chunk of the money to do their own, um, you know, strategic sort of things, yeah. initiatives in stadiums or um, you know, they, this, digital, this digital business they want to build by themselves, which is... AFL Media, but on steroids. So for the NRL, things the like NRL that. The NRL want to do that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in, in a way, look, the, the NRL clubs and the NRL itself are, are, are playing catch-up yeah. with uh, the AFL. So there is still roughly the same amount of money, probably a little bit less at the moment, but not the huge gap going to NRL clubs yeah. as there is AFL clubs. But these NRL clubs are way behind in getting, say, for example, membership income. It's growing quickly. But, you know, if, look, if Collingwood has 60,000, 70,000 members, Souths or, or Brisbane might have 25,000 at the very most and that right. slides off pretty quickly. There's clubs with 10,000 members and that sort of thing, maybe a little bit more. Um, commercially, they're nowhere near as good as the AFL clubs is getting in, you know, big big headline sponsors just yet. Some right. of them are but not not as many. So you, they need really more top money. Because you've got sponsors in the AFL, don't you? You know, you've got the, you've got the Lexuses, you've got yeah. the Emirates. Every car you've brand got the, seems to sponsor a club, right? So. Yeah, mm. that's right. So so that's the that's what the NRL are arguing over at the yep. moment, basically, that the clubs are saying, well, we'd like more money. And the NRL are going, well, we'd actually, we think we can spend it better than you guys can and we want to have it going into these other things. Exactly right. So it's that classic, you know, who gets what of the money. It's a bit like that that argument about the players and that's going to happen in the NRL too. The NRL players also want a percentage of their revenue. So it's all they're all pretty similar um, scenarios in a way. So that's the, that's the challenge of the NRL over the next few years is betting down this independent commission. Yes, and, and, and maintaining control because, I mean, the clubs would love to have control back again. So, so has the commission basically stared them down for now? It has for now, but it's probably put put the fight off to later in the year, which where right. they might, it might be the whole same song and dance yet again. So they sort of wait till the season to be over, something like that. Let's yeah, get the season done. <laughs> John, um, the A League, how's that stacking up at the minute? Do you think? Because I read somewhere recently. I mean, they're, they're apart from the infighting with the clubs and, and that sort of thing that's going on at the moment. They, they seem they're, they're very much tied to uh, Australia making the World Cup and stuff like that. How is that... What difference does that make? Like, if Australia didn't qualify for the next World Cup, how would that pan down to the A-League? Look, they do, the money? Have, they do have a record TV deal now from Fox that they've just signed for next year onwards, and they've got some free-to-air stuff still to come with that too, so that certainly does help. But, yeah, the whole push and pull here is is um, the FFA will get a big chunk of money if the Socceroos make it. Yep. They also have to spend a lot of money on it as well. But the A-League clubs argue that 80% of the money that comes in you know, for TV, for example, is actually derived because of the A-League, not the Socceroos. So right. we should get 80% of that revenue or thereabouts. You know, so the, the, is it, would it be a huge blow to the FFA if they didn't qualify? Yes. Would it be a death knell? Probably not because the A-League's grown so much and, you know, has become quite, you know, reasonably commercially viable, notwithstanding there's still, you know, several issues they need to work through um, for it to for the game to be able to stand it on their own two feet. As as long as as long as they can keep a chunk of the revenue and not have to hive it off to the club. So it's you know, it's 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 a pretty it, it difficult scenario. It isn't it? What the sport is, um, it all comes down to percentages. It does the revenue, well, doesn't it? I mean who gets but how the, the pie, cake, how the know? cake's cut, basically. Exactly. Well, there's exactly. plenty of money coming in, but there's plenty of mouths to feed too. So to give us context, and this is an obvious question in a way that, you know, what the answer will be, but I'm just more looking at the size of it. How much of a success has the A-League been compared to what was before with the NSL, which was basically bankrupt was one of the reasons. Like you look overall and say the A-League's been a huge success for 
for football. It feels like now they've hit another stage where they've had to sort of say pull the pull the brakes a bit on expanding more. Yep. They yep. need they need a bit more. They seem to be reaching a new stage where they need to wring more out of what they've got rather than adding more to it. They're less in a growth phase than what they thought. It's got to be more organic. Yep. Is that where they're at? Is that? But in terms of actually a success, it has been a big success. Well, I think if you, I mean, I don't know if you ever went to NSL games. And that I sort did of stuff. go to a couple. I'm yeah. still scarred from. Them. Well, yeah, I, I, they were actually they were very exciting, but they, they mm-hmm. did have that air of. And I should add, I'm a big, I'm a victory member. Mm-hmm gone to uh, games, A-League games since day dot and so really am a fan. Um, and the, and I think the just playing at the stadiums they play at now is just a huge improvement. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was a Canberra Cosmos um, oh, right. and, I, and I think we could probably fit the whole membership in this <laughs> the room. Canberra Cosmos. There you there's go. A, so. There's a sporting oh, yeah. team you, you don't hear much about. Well, anymore. that's right. There was, wasn't many of us at there. The end, I'm the sure. end, so, yeah. So, I mean, look, if you said um, 10 years ago that we could have a, a league that, you know, averages, I don't know, whatever it is, say 14,000, 15,000 fans, you have sold out derbies in, you know, Sydney and Melbourne in particular. Yeah. Um, people would have gone, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, because you often forget how far we've exactly. come as well. Like They're not the a- a- AFL or NRL yet, but they yeah. have made significant... They've carved steps. out a fantastic niche. I mean, the Sydney Derby is is one of the must-see spectacles on the Sydney sporting scene of the year. Yeah. And, you know, Melbourne Victory versus Melbourne City down here will sell out Eddie Had. I mean, that's, I mean, that would never have happened back in the NSL days. Yeah. Structurally, it still has a problem. It's still a costly thing. And because of the structure of soccer around the world... We have private owners. They have to tip money in. And sport's different here in Australia. Like if you own Leicester City or Manchester United over in England, you also own the stadium. So you can get all the money from tickets and, and you know, the corporate boxes, the car parks around it. That doesn't happen here in Australia. So it's a tougher road for these private owners, I suppose. Right. And so the A-League's at a point where it's not going to expand anytime soon now. They've worked out that that was going to stretch them financially. Well, yeah, they need to come up with a different model and I think what might end up happening is the FFA still control the league and but give up some ownership of it to the clubs. Because that's so, the current argument yeah. that's ha- fight that's going on is there's a sense isn't there amongst the clubs and a lot of real football people as they like to think of themselves oh, yes. that, that headquarters doesn't get them and doesn't give them enough of a voice and... and and say in how the sport has run as a whole. Is that sort of what the argument's about or is behind that really just money again? Oh, well, it, is, it goes back to money because the club, because the private owners put in money and they make losses every year and they want, you know, to stop doing that and in order to do that they need to get more of the central revenue. So it does come back to money but it's also, you know, it, there's a lot, so much talk in, in soccer at the moment about the structure and the business model, yeah. which is exciting to me, but I'm not sure it's exciting to the uh, general public as a whole. But what what is the business model? That's what what do they say is wrong with the way it's currently? Is it the way that the, what they can charge for? Or well, what? it goes back to the, the the same argument of the clubs and the other codes. Money comes in, doesn't go enough to the clubs themselves. Right. The shortfall that the clubs um, have is is funded by. The private owners, so they, these these guys, and they are all pretty much guys that actually yeah. you know tip in their own money. So they they don't want to keep making losses forever. Is their argument? So that, that's a case where they're saying, um, or oh, come on, and FFA, more money needs to flow down to us. Basically, when, exactly. they, when they talk about a new business model, that's what they really mean. Oh, absolutely, and yeah, so more money and more say in and more say in the strategic direction of the of the um of the league. Do you think that's do they, there's a view that seems to be amongst A League people that the league doesn't promote itself well enough? Is that do you get a sense of that? Do you uh, think that's fair, or do you think that's just part of this argument being dressed up? To no, sort of I whack? think it is fair. Uh, I mean, like you know, and and I, uh, I class myself as a big football fan, but football fans are you know uh, are notorious for being uh, completely and utterly pessimistic most of the time. <laughs> but look, you look, you're right. There's not enough marketing money that goes in to the A League, but that's also probably a um, because, you know, the FFA don't have enough money to spend on marketing. So it's kind of like yeah. because they've got to spend so much money on, you know, sending national youth teams all around the world and all this sort of thing. It's a, it's a very unique thing that they have to do. Right. And so th- what the A-League owners say, well, okay, let us control the, the league and you guys do the rest. But the FFA say, well, we probably can't do that, do the rest yeah. without having some of the money from the A-League. So it's kind of like, and the same, again, percentages. And the same thing is like there's... By creating a different business model doesn't mean there's going to be more money. It just means some people will have more money, but others will have less. So you're not going to, you're not suddenly creating 
a lot more money to spend on marketing. No, although these private owners do argue that they could run it, it the better. business better. They could commercialise it, it better. a bit of how everyone um, says that they could run it better than government and then they get into government and find that there's no savings like they thought was there. Yeah, yeah, I, think, yeah I think you're right. <laughs> and John, just a question that's sort of a bit out of left field, hmm. um, you being the financial expert. How big a windfall will the Shepherd and Commonwealth Games be? <laughs> oh look, I mean, uh, I think the economic impact study will be uh, will be one to watch. I mean, look, it's always it's going to be in the hundreds of millions, a, isn't it? And for regional Australia, it's a long way wasn't off. it going to be shared between several cities? Yeah, so yeah I think Shepherd sort of have got the, the main fulcrum of it or something. It's all Victorian regional cities, yeah, isn't Victorian it? Are going to bid for it because the Commonwealth Games in terrible trouble because Durban doesn't don't want them. But the Gold Coast seem to be promoting themselves pretty heavily for next year and, and seem to be yeah. doing it reasonably well. Well, they're, they're, they're in that one year to go anniversary, yeah. so they could, yeah, that's right. So that it, it's, a bit of a, they're, it's yeah. ramping up. You know, Channel 7's been talking about their coverage and their sponsorship. I mean, for what it is, the Commonwealth Games will actually be wildly popular here next year because yeah. everyone loves to watch Australia winning stuff, right? And, yeah. you know, yeah. actually, mind you, the, the Brits will probably come and uh, win, every, win, win all the gold <laughs> And also, if you're going to go to the Commonwealth Games, you'd rather go to the Gold Coast than Shepherd. <laughs> well, someone I saw who lives in right. Shepherd and said, we're the ice capital of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well, how is this going to help us? Is there a winter Commonwealth Games we can bid for? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, getting on to rugby union, which is a so another sport. I I I've all, I grew up watching a lot of rugby union, really enjoyed it. Um, and for a while there, I've always AFL's probably been my favourite because I grew up in Melbourne. But I, for a while there, I enjoyed watching rugby almost as much. And then I've systematically seen it from the Rod McQueen leaving years, the Eddie Jones years onwards. It being, to my sense, always run into the ground in a way and not capturing a bunch of opportunities it could have captured. Um, is that a fair summation or do you think I'm being overly harsh? Because it seemed after the 2003 World Cup, there was real momentum behind the Wallabies and the ARU and they chose to go to Perth instead of Melbourne and then they seemed to just slowly start to be terrible on the field but start to really drop off in promotion and, and the competition as a whole. Is that fair? Well, look, there's, there's nothing that could fix uh, Rugby Union quicker than actually winning the Bledisloe Cup for the first time in a decade or so. But, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's very... 2003 or something or yeah, something that's right. amazing. I mean, we haven't might learn it. The Wallabies used to be the premium sports brand there yeah, for a while. They used right. to attract something like $30 million in sponsorship. I mean, there'd be all the blue chip brands. I mean, I know I, at that stage I was living in Canberra, but, you know, oh, there would be advertising yeah, campaigns yeah, with, you know, with with players, uh, individual players in the Wallabies teams featuring in these advertising campaigns. I mean, that that's unheard of now. So, look, results on the field, uh, you know, do but count. But the Socceroos no one would have overtaken them as a national Absolutely. sporting that's team, right. wouldn't they? Yeah. And they, you know, and because the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup is yeah. such a huge deal every... I know the Rugby World Cup was really big last time we made the final, but people have probably forgotten about that already. Yeah. Yeah. And, look, it probably goes to some of the structure of... The, I mean, this amazingly unwieldy super rugby structure where we have teams from South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina and Japan. And yeah. and even... And I grew up playing rugby, you know, very badly. Um I couldn't tell you where these teams are from because they refuse to put the the places in the names. I mean, it's just so. Yeah. It, to me, it's breathtakingly arrogant not to actually tell general sports fans, or not to you know assist general sports fans uh, to understand your competition. Yeah. It's like a, some sort of an in in joke or an in sort of you know you have to be part of our little you know gang or something to yeah. actually understand See, what I, we're I doing. I reckon uh, th- there are very few Australian sports fans, or, or not very few. There there would be a lot that wouldn't even know. That competition was an international one, for example. You know, for precisely well, that reason. You had the Reds and the Brumbies and the, the this and that, but you have no idea. There's no, you, you don't get. And I've never been a big rugby fan, but I've always been when the World Cup was on or when they played the All Blacks. You, you being a sports fan, you naturally gravitate to it. But now you just don't seem to have any knowledge or, or, or you know, ownership of, of, of the actual program itself. And as far as the game's concerned. Well, there's no context to it and that's the no, problem. No context. There's no tribalism to it unless yeah. unless it is that Australia unless versus you're New Zealand. The All Blacks and you want to beat maybe the, All Blacks. the Springboks. Yeah, the Springboks. And Queensland and New South Wales. And, and with yeah. the Brumbies, it's always beating up the bigger cousins in New South Wales yeah. or Queensland. And they had a lot Outside of success of that, early on, hard. the Brumbies. Absolutely. So it sort of made them have a bit of relevancy. And they've arguably been the most successful yes. super rugby franchise in Australia. But I look at the, um, I look at the Rebels... And I and I'm a fan, I'll watch any sport, you know. 
And the rebels just do nothing for me. Like, and I don't know why, but they just if when they talked about maybe the rebels could be the ones to go under, it would almost have no impact on the average sports fan in this city. It is, which is quite amazing. You know, like the storm when it would have a much bigger impact. Well, it's probably a bit sad in, in that way because there's some really good people there and they try hard and all that sort of thing. No, but they I agree just with can't. that. It's probably, they're probably irrelevant. They just haven't yeah. 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 enough. And I, no. I, guess, I guess lack of success yes. doesn't help. I mean, they've never been a strong club. I, in, I, in the, whereas the Storm, people, once they, they were, when they started the Melbourne Storm, they were very media savvy. You, you, the Storm players were just everywhere across every radio and TV station. And then when they started winning, Premierships and being a, a bit of a successful club, non-rugby league people in Melbourne sort of embrace them. They go, "Look, I'm, I'm like Barrack for Collingwood, but yeah, I like the Storm because they're our Melbourne team." Yeah, I reckon the Rebels, their, their lack of on-field success has made it harder for them to cut through has, to the general public. It, it probably yeah. helped too, by the way, with the Storm that they were owned by News Corp, so they would get a run in True. the News Corp They'd papers. Right, so there was a little bit of a, a thing there with the media. You're right, but I mean, but but I found one of the most insightful moments for me where I. The ARU, so I was desperate for the ARU to put a team here when the when they chose the four. So I remember being gutted when they did, and uh, and then the Rebels pop up many years later as a bit of almost seemed like a bit of an afterthought. But by that time, the momentum had all been lost, so the interest had gone. But I remember going to a couple of ARU events that I got invited to, and games in between that, the force being set up and Melbourne being ignored. And I went to a couple of international. I went to the Wallabies versus, I think, Italy at one point at Etihad Stadium. And then another one, I'm thinking it might have been France. Um, and I got invited to the official, uh, with some other people, the official ARU function in Melbourne. And you go to the, you go to the, uh, you know, go to the AFL ones down here or even the Collingwood or Melbourne or the, and they're big events. And even when I go, I go to the Sydney Swans um events often and do a speech up there at the president's function and do you stuff. Go, do you go to more corporate events than I do? Probably. I, get invi- I have oh. to speak at a lot of them and get up and tell jokes to people who oh. often don't know, don't follow the sport, which That's makes a it di- a bit... So sometimes you'll That's say... different to me. In, when I do ones in Sydney, I'll say, I make a joke and they'll go, I don't know who that person is. <laughs> so, which can be kind of interesting. You're dying on stage. But... Um, you go and they're really well-run events, right? They're corporate but they're very well-run events. There's lots of people. You've got c- celebrities. And I mean celebrities of the business community and of the sport community. And then, you know, but you've got people you know and all these reasons. I remember getting this AR, a couple of ARU events held at Etihad Stadium. They hadn't booked the big room, right? And they said – and they had the – they had, like, the Premier there and various other people of that ilk. But it was this huge room that could have seated 500 – they didn't have seating tables. They had because uh, often league do this. They're, they're more stand up at corporate yeah, events are, while yeah. AFL sit down. So they were standing, but they probably had about fifty people in this room that could have fitted two to three hundred people. And you kind of walked in, and there was no one there to really greet you. you like you could have just amateur. And it was just so like. And anyway, there was a bunch of the ARU board there. This was going back five, six years, right? They didn't come up and they all just sat in a corner of the board, like not engaging with the Melbourne people barely at all. Like it was like you could just, it was just palpable they didn't want to be there and that they saw this as an irrelevant event. And I remember a few very, I was the least important person in the room, but I remember a couple of politicians, senior bureaucrats and business people just going, they hate us, don't they? They hate Melbourne. They just hate us. And these were people that were so rugby fans. And yeah. so I, I yeah. could see back then the ARU have paid no attention to – and this isn't me being a parochial Melbourne person because I would actually like them to do well down here. But you could just – it was so palpable that I was kind of going, guys, come on, like – well, there was no, there's no, there was no expansion plan. I suppose that, no that, that other that other codes did. You know, yeah, there was, it just got yeah, as you say, plopped here. They had a private owner in Harold Mitchell who ended up spending a lot of money. Yeah, I also do like how that you judge a sport uh, on, on its corporate, on its corporate hospitality. Box, yeah, <laughs> hospitality. But you know, you do are, we, get, are we kindred spirits or something? <laughs> but you do get a sense of like you go to a certain events at certain things. And there is a real energy around them, whether it's out in the stand, whether it's in the corporate boxes, whether it's at the media events, you know, like there's an interest. And here you had two international teams, all these were doing quite well at the time, and the corporate event had been thrown, was sparsely attended and sparsely promoted or run. And you kind of go, this is a major sport. This isn't like 
going to just, you know, the... Like, I'd been to, you know, amateur footy nights that were better run. Like, you know what I mean? It was sort of just an insight into that slickness that you get at an NRL event. Yep. Because I've been to, you know, NRL, various things, you know, even club events and stuff like that. Just much better run. Just have a real sense of they know what they're doing. Fireworks make all the difference. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and things like, like say, the Melbourne Victory, for example, you know, doing quarterly corporate lunches that get 1,200 people in the room. Yeah. And they do, and they, and they get, you they know, do five very or 600. Well. And I mean, they've just copied the AFL model. Well, they've, they've copied it and, and gone well that's past That's right. It. But, I yeah. mean, in terms of, like, the they know this event works. We mm. know Melbourne. We do it this way and it works. And, you know, they, the A-League I've found very well run when I've gone to it. And I'm talking, like... Not every one I've gone to has been as a corporate. I've gone. I go to most as just and uh, as just you know you go to Amy Park just with a normal general admission ticket. It's a very slick operation going to the Eight Lake there. It's really good to go to. You know, like they heard some will talk about it being all flares at five paces every second, but it's not. It's actually very family friendly. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's right, and and it's fun to go to, I suppose. And yeah. Uh, rugby. I mean, look, there's law changes as well that have gone in there. It's become a really hard sport to to oh, follow. Oh, I, I, I don't think the product itself has done yeah. themselves any favours. Right? No, that's what I mean. Just, it's yeah, hard to it's, follow it's, on the field. You know, you have to have spend a bit of time on. learning yeah. it, and then what, do you think it will be the force or the? We're recording this ahead of any decision being made. Do you have a sense? Is there a Who's the who's the odds on favourite to be cut the force or the or the rebels? Well, the whisper is that uh, that, that it is the force because they effectively got taken over by the ARU uh, last year. So it's sort easier of bailed them out. Them. It's easier for them to do. And there's private owners in Melbourne who um, you know could take them take them lawyers at ten paces. Not we're saying that the force have actually you know, lodged it as well. They themselves. have, but it's a bit yeah. harder because of because, because of the ownership. They own it, yeah. yeah, they're kind of like suing themselves in a way. <laughs> That's always a bit of fun. That's rugby for you, isn't it? Uh, Just netball. Mm. They've signed a new TV deal and it seems like theirs is a slightly interesting deal that's not like the other TV deals. Why is that? So what they've done is um, they've gone out and struck a deal with Channel 9 uh, you know, to try and get on, you know, one of the big three, I suppose. But they've got an advertising share deal with them. So, you know, I guess they've both got skin in the game. And, in fact, um, in the Netball Australia... um, uh, headquarters in Melbourne, you know, leading up to the season, mm. they actually embedded Channel Nine salespeople in there, so they're really working together. And, and right. Telstra is involved as well, so there's Telstra TV. Yeah, and you can get free, as well. uh, yeah. free streaming and stuff like that. If you're exactly. Telstra customers, so they're trying to sort of work with it. Sounds like it might be quite a clever, clever way of doing it down the track. Given that netball is a massive junior sport, but isn't obviously have the same impact as, as AFL or NRL on the senior level. But given that it is an emerging thing, it may be a very smart way of doing because they, they know they're not going to sell a billion-dollar TV rights deal. But do you reckon this is a clever way of doing it? It's, it's almost like bringing your own sponsors along with for the ride, isn't it? Absolutely. And the other thing that they've done too is align themselves with uh, AFL and NRL teams, right? So yeah. there's the Melbourne Storm own or have a joint JV up on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, there's a the Collingwood, Collingwood netball team and the yeah, GWS. Yeah. So that's tapped into that that sort of alignment with established um, sports brands as well. There's still issues to be worked out as to, you know, the, the pathways through to the established clubs that are owned by the state federations and these private ones. And that'll, that'll sort of come out. But I think both, I mean, they've, they're having a crack. They have, they're trying to be innovative. Yeah. And in this very crowded sports market, I think you're right. It's, 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 yeah, it's to be commended. That. Yeah, I agree. I, th- I think somebody at netball is thinking laterally and, you know, and that's not something that you... You naturally think sporting organisations do a lot of the time. It's it's pretty cut and dried, and we'll do it this way because it's always been done this way. No, I think it's a fantastic thing. I mean, you know, and and this could serve as a model for these other so-called you know lesser sports. You think of all those Olympic sports. I mean, thing like nitro athletics, for example. Yeah. I mean, athletics, you know, carnivals are probably deathly boring to watch over three hours on TV, but you packaged it up like they did over a couple of nights and put it on Channel 7 and got Usain Bolt in as a shareholder mm. in the competition. And that was pretty smart, and they could take that out around the world potentially. Again, it's a sport that's trying to think a little bit differently, faced with these behemoths that are the AFL and NRL and cricket, really. Where does netball fit then in the side of things? Like it's most the, the, Say this deal makes them semi professional on the on the road, I think is the language they used for becoming professional. Where does it rank, say, compared in revenue terms to, say, the NBL? Like, to give it a sense, is it similar, smaller? 
It's probably smaller still. I mean, so, it's reasonably comparable in a way. I'm thinking somewhere between sort of 10 to 15 million, you know, right. on a central body basis. It may have actually be bigger than the NBL. A lot of those NBL teams are regional um, yeah. ones, although... You, you know, you have someone like the Perth Wildcats that might make a million dollar profit, yeah, which is actually really good. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, but, uh, you, but it is still a it's still a semi professional sport. Netball, it it's got a bit to go. But the women players are paid more than the other these other codes are at the moment, and they've yeah. actually struck a pretty good deal. So, you know, they're actually going quite well. Uh, the last one I'd probably cover off on. I mean, we could talk. I, I, I don't know if people listening are finding it interesting, but I could talk for hours about this stuff because I think it goes to the heart of everything that we, we as sports fans often get frustrated about. Um, the EBA, the cricket, we talk, touched on there, currently having an argument where the Cricket Australia want to take back the revenue sharing deal and the Players Association don't. That looks like it's one that could get quite nasty. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's that, that, that's, that seems, I think, there's a lot of money flowing around cricket with India and various things now that I think they've seen... Yeah. That it's really worth the players trying to die in a ditch to hang on to that revenue sh- sh- sharing Well, model. they've got it, so why would they want to lose it? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is why it's interesting that sort of, uh, you know, cricket's obviously employing some, you know, mining-style, I think, enterprise bargaining agreement sort of negotiations to sort of hive off, you know, one part of the workforce to another, uh, you know, and, and pitch the elites against the rest or try and buy or off the... the women the, against... Why that's the right. men pay? I love that my favourite one that they keep making is... Why won't the men hand over some of their salary to the women? And I'm a bit like, well, one, there's a lot of money in cricket. Mm. So the empl- in my sense, the employers usually pay employees. They don't cut other employees, take, take it from other employees. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a bit like if you open a new McDonald's. And McDonald's say, well, to our existing branches, your your employees are going to get paid less so we can pay these new employees, but aren't we great and why won't you do that? That's what it seems like Cricket Australia are doing a bit to me. Well, and it's a PR battle, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, acting like po- these t- mm. terrible men are taking yeah. all the money and you're like, well, hang on, they're the employees. You've got more money. We've seen that in a business sense and I guess not everyone does, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's you know, particularly in this rise of women's sports, um, trying to say, look, you know, the women deserve more, but but you know, the men are the men are preventing them from getting it, which is well, they're well, not the, probably they're not the employer. That's the thing I find yeah, funny. That's right. It's kind of it's just weird because it wouldn't stand up for two seconds. I, I, when I look at my sports journalists, you're you know you do the business side of stuff and see that stuff, but when I read a lot of the stuff in the paper about the sports journalists, they say, well, why wouldn't the men pay for the women? And you kind of go, hang on. Imagine saying that about any other as company. It hasn't worked in any other industry. Yeah, in any other industry, where would you say, yeah. you know, if the, empl- if, the, if the Cricket Australia want to have more employees, wouldn't you have to pay for the more employees? Well, that's right. So it all comes back to, you know, that uh, the fact that these players are extremely well paid and that's what, uh, you know, the public <laughs> thinks. So. Yeah. What about the BBL? How, how big has the BBL been as a success? We, it, It's talked about as a huge success and it obviously is in terms of attendance and popularity. Has that translated into financial success though in the same to you know to the same amount that it would people would suspect oh yeah well it helps that there's a salary cap right so that and it's not like the ipl in india where they can you know buy, a, just, a player comes yeah. in for a million dollars on auction or anything like that so there is i mean the players are pretty well paid but it's still that secondary level so um all, all of the eight franchises are effectively profitable which is fantastic right, right. so they've done extremely well and Channel 10 getting it at roughly $20 million a year is, is in hindsight, an absolute bargain. Yeah. And when um, Cricket Australia go to the market in a couple of months' time to, for their next broadcast rights, that $20 million for the BBL could easily turn into 50 or 60 and the 80 that Channel 9 are paying for the international matches could go could down. easily go down to 50 or 60. So you might have, you know, the be comparable, which is an amazing thing for what is a competition that doesn't involve the elite players most of the time and isn't mm. effectively a TV product, a fantastic TV product. Mm. I mean, we watch it at home. My wife loves it because it's just entertainment for three hours every night yeah. in summer and it's there every night. If you look at those reality TV shows or whatever, everyone knows it's regular program. You know, okay, at 8.30, so-and-so's on. Okay. Every night in summer, yeah, you don't have 7 think. o'clock, it's yeah. the cricket and, and it's going to be yeah, entertaining. Exactly. And the other, the other thing I reckon the BBL have done well, and this surprised me, is that the, the, none of the, the, the teams have, are aligned with existing teams. They've all been created from scratch. And I remember about the second year of the BBL, I t- took my boys along to watch, and I was staggered how many, like, grown men there were who were either, you know, renegades, supporters, 
or um, stars, stars, yeah. stars. I mean, and I dressed thought, in the full and kit. Dressed in the full, yeah, I thought, yeah, I, I get the kids doing that, but but they somehow have managed to create these new franchises that people have, uh, have hooked on to. Yeah, people love a derby, I suppose, don't yeah, they? But they but they do. learned that they learned from going over to, which I think is really interesting. They learned from going over to America and watching minor league baseball in yeah. America mm. and things like going to, you know, the Ringling Brothers Circus and stuff. So what's entertainment look like? It doesn't matter if your team wins or loses in minor league baseball as long as you're entertained for three hours and let's make it cheap for families and get kids and families to go along. Yeah. That was a very smart marketing decision. So people, will, we, you know, we tune in and we don't necessarily care who wins as long as we're entertained. Yeah. Is that pure sport? Well, you know, the wow. purists will have a, fi- yeah, have a real is. day with it's that. Absolutely. But, it's but not people like are watching. A, it's not like AFL or league where, you know, if your team loses, you're bitter for a yeah. and then the whole next week. You know, if the Stars lose or the Renegades lose, people are like, oh, it's a shame. But you don't see people like – you don't see what you saw with the – and you might in the future when generations of support behind it, but you don't see people openly weep, weeping like when Cronulla or the Bulldogs pull off a, a grand final yeah. win suddenly, you know, because yeah, the, be, the stars there finally There won't be got 70-year-olds <laughs> crying when, when <laughs> the Renegades win. You know, the what's the, what's the mark of that passion? With, with that with the, the big bash. Mm. It's the same like with Channel 10. It, um, you look at their investment and how it's paying off for them. Because I remember that the very first year I was talking to somebody who's fairly high up there on the sales, and they said, we couldn't give away the bloody sponsorship. It was the same with the first year of MasterChef. He said, the first year of MasterChef, the general consensus amongst all the agencies and the advertisers were, we don't need another cooking show. Um, okay, we'll buy a cheap sponsorship to it. And he said, after that first season of the MasterChef, all our packages started at a million point five. And if you didn't want to get on board, well, there was plenty of others who came on. And Channel 10 milked that sort of formula pretty well with a big bash. Mm. It helps that the, of course, that the product has been incredibly popular with viewers. But again, it's not just when you think of the money of sport, the broadcasters too have to make their money as well. And, and they're lucky when they latch on to something. As good and, as and, and it showed you what they did, I think, this year where they... they always used to avoid going head-to-head with the Australian Open Tennis because that was a winner yes. every night for Channel 7. This year they went to head-to-head a lot and took a, you know chunks of ratings out of yeah, 7 yeah, and it shows you that actually how much how, how relevant like it's become. Channel 7 got a hell of a shock this year when that happened. Oh, yeah. Well, they might not be, luckily for Channel 7, they might not be a Channel 10 in a few years' time, <laughs> <laughs> the way they're going. I think they'd like that you know comfortable <laughs> duopoly perhaps, <laughs> just like the rest of Australian business. Well, John, it's been a pleasure having you on. Yeah. Thanks for your time and I think it's... Very interesting when you think about all this stuff because uh, where the money goes often tells the story. So uh, thanks for coming on. We'd love to have you back at some point too when the next uh, next big financial crisis happens, which is probably you know, in a week or so in sport. You're probably right. And well, I think World it... War Three breaks out, surely. That'll throw a spanner in the works. <laughs> yeah. If that does happen, John, how do you reckon it'll affect the Port Adelaide Gold Coast game in <laughs> Shanghai? <will it? laughs> well, that's meant to be sold out already, isn't yeah. it? Probably with mostly Australian experts. No, it's well, been tied a us bit of corporate boxing. Well, I was yeah, going to say, right. if there's one place I'm going to see... the Chinese on it. If there's one place I'm going to see Titus again, it's clearly going to be the corporate box. <laughs> oh, hopefully he invites you along, Sergio. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. He keeps me at arm's length. At He's been banned things. from every over with yeah, Australia. Most, most corporate <laughs> events, basically. <laughs> oh, well, thanks very good. We'll see you soon. I hope you're back soon. That would be great. No, thanks, gents. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Thank you.